Okay, we continue with our second evening session, and we are on page 36. And the next point that we want to uh, discuss after uh, Ministry of Impartation is number 18, Stepping Out in Faith. Now, some of you who are uh, studying the materials, listening to the audio tapes, uh, are wondering, well, gee, can I really do this? Okay, and there's one thing that we need to clarify here, and it's this. God does not use ability. Okay, the kingdom does not operate like the world. Remember what we said uh, in one of our previous sessions? In the world, you have to earn everything and perform. In the kingdom, everything is grace. It's given. Huh? Jesus didn't call 12 Bible scholars to be apostles. He called 12 common men to establish the church. And the church has been operating with common people ever since. Huh? Okay? And it's lasted nearly 2,000 years, and it's going to go on forever, isn't it? By common people. Which has to tell you what? That it isn't ability that God uses, it's availability. Are you available? God will use you. Huh? So what you have to do is understand that you don't need any special qualifications to be used by God to uh, minister healing or deliverance or to be part of restoration ministry. It's not, you know, you don't have to have special qualifications. See? Okay? All you have to... All you have to do is be the empty vessel and yield to the Holy Spirit, and he'll show you what to do. He's the one doing the ministry. It's the Holy Spirit doing the ministry. See? Not us. Huh? Okay? And so you must have a right identification, and through it, the Holy Spirit will restore the identification of the person receiving ministry with his spirit, and then the healing flows. Huh? Okay? They stop identifying with their problems. See? And they start identifying with Jesus and his power and his ability. See? And then they start taking possession. Okay? And part of that taking possession, by the way, is being willing to set aside the problems. Huh? And going on with God. And that's one of the th major things you have to minister to them. Is having the willingness to set all these things aside. And just start from this day forward going on with God. Huh? The scripture says forget the past. <clears throat> Doesn't it? Paul says in the New Testament scripture, forget the past. <laughs> See? Yeah. See? That's very, very important. In other words, what is Paul saying? Set it aside. Setting aside is one of the major principles, okay, of taking possession of healing and deliverance and uh, restoration. Okay? All right. Uh, 19. In the appendices... In the back of the book, you will see model prayers for whether you are going to minister healing or deliverance, circumcision of heart, or confession, repentance, and renouncing. Okay, remember what we said. There's only four things that you minister uh, scripturally. Okay? You can use those for the ministry, or you can be led by the Spirit to pray your own way. Okay? Either one is okay with the Spirit. I've heard people say, oh, you've got to pray from the Spirit. You know? The living waters have to be stirred up in your belly and you've got to bring it forth and you've got to express it, you know, that way. Well, hold on, folks. How about the baby Christian that hasn't gotten baptized in the Holy Spirit yet? You mean God's not going to hear his prayers or her prayers? How about the baby or the young Christian? Okay, who's learning the principles of walking the faith walk. You mean until they reach the point where they're praying fluently in the spirit, God's not going to hear their prayers? See? No. God honors the intent of the heart, doesn't he? Okay? And God honors faith. Okay? Those are the two important ingredients 
of prayer, whether there, it's from the Spirit, whether it's in tongues, whether it's read from a page, whether it's mechanical or not, God's going to first see, did you back that with faith? Amen. Right? right? Okay, and he's going to honor the intent of your heart. Okay, so don't be fearful about whether you can use those prayers or not. Just step out in faith. Okay, now, when you minister those prayers in the appendices section of the manual, okay, the way I like to minister is through the prayer of agreement. Why? Because Jesus says if two or three are gathered together in my name and agree to touch upon anything upon the earth, I am present and will grant what you ask. Well, you're one, the minister. The ministry is two, so that qualifies, right? Okay? And then if you enter into agreement, the Lord is present because you're empty vessels and he's ministering through you, right? Right? So then the prayer of agreement ought to work and it's in the spirit so the rhema happening comes from the faith-filled word so the happening's got to happen. Amen. <laughs> See? It's not hard. All you have to know is biblical dynamics of how it works. Amen. See, God's, God's given you the revelation. He's revealed it all in the scriptures. See? The church has to wake up. That's all. Okay? And step out in faith. You see? Okay? But if we do it God's way, it'll work. So, we've got all of the ingredients for it to work right there. So, what we need to do is pray prayer of agreement. Huh? And how will we pray prayer of agreement so that the ministry can understand what it is he's taking possession of at the same time that we're praying the prayer of agreement. Well, the, well the, uh, the answer to that question is simple. I tell the ministry, here's how we're going to enter into agreement. I am going to pray the prayer, whether I do it spontaneously, because I know these prayers now in my head, okay, or whether I read it from the page, doesn't matter, okay? I say to the ministry, now you enter into agreement by listening to my words, number one, listen to my words. If you agree with what I am saying, or what the Spirit is saying through me, rather, then you repeat it. Okay? So they enter into agreement by repetition. Hearing what is said first, and then agreeing with it by repeating it. Then you know they're in agreement. They've used their will. See? See? And that's how we do it. Okay, so we pray a prayer of agreement through repetition. Okay? And that's, by the way, all of the prayers, except, uh, uh, and including the deliverance prayer, but informal deliverance. When you do deliverance by binding uh, the spirits, loosing the person and commanding the spirits be cast out in Jesus' name. Okay? The ministry should not pray at all during deliverance. And the reason for that is because very often the spirits are coughed out or they're wretched, they retch or vomit, okay? And if you've got praise on your lips, the spirits don't want to come forward, okay? And they fight and fight and fight leaving, see? Okay? But if, and you pray for, you give the commands of deliverance for the ministry. That's the only exception where the ministry does not pray. Okay? After the deliverance, the ministry can praise all he or she wants, right? Okay? Because when there's praise prayer on the lips, okay, of the ministry, what does the scripture say? It says, the Lord inhabits the praise. See? Okay? And... The spirits are terrified and they put maximum effort into resisting. Say, okay, so rather than helping a deliverance, if the ministry is doing that, okay, it's hindering deliverance because of the circumstance. Okay, the Holy Spirit will get the spirit out anyway. 
Okay? It's the Holy Spirit who's doing the deliverance, not you or me. Okay? But what we are doing is creating the conditions for the Spirit to move. Huh? Okay? Yeah. What? You just said also the mass deliverance. Yes. Yes, that is true. Yes, if that's true of mass deliverance. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, number 20. Before beginning ministry in the spirit with the ministry, it is important to review with them the concept of their identity in Christ, lost through the fall, that it has been restored by the born-again experience and their relationship with the Lord, it's therefore important now to be sure before you start ministry that they understand the believer's authority. Okay? Who they are in Christ. That their identification is restored. And because their identification is restored... They are heart to heart with the Lord again, which means the Zoe life of God can flow to them. And in that Zoe life of God is the healing and the deliverance and the circumcision of the heart and the freedom from sin. See? And unless they know their identity in Christ and the believer's authority, right? Uh, John 10, 34 was it? It said, ye are God's. Okay? Why are ye gods? Okay? Ye are gods because ye are made in the image and likeness of God, and you have a covenant with God, and only gods can be in the kingdom of God. Amen. Huh? Okay? But what that means is as the Lord permits, okay, ye are gods over your circumstances, aren't you? Okay? Because of the believer's authority. Believer's authority is Luke 10, 17, 19, and 20. Huh? It's 1 John 4, 4. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the earth. Amen. Right? Luke 10, 17. Even the demons obey us in your name. Right? Luke 10, 19. I give you power to trample over serpents and scorpions and authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall harm you. And then in verse 20, Jesus repeats what they said in verse 17. Rejoice not that the demons obey you. See, he confirms it. Okay? But that your names are written in heaven. Huh? So that's the believer's authority. Okay? And then in Mark 11, 23, 24, Jesus says, If you speak to the mountain." And you say to the mountain, be uprooted and cast into the sea, believing uh, without doubt in your heart. You shall have whatsoever you say. Say. You shall have whatsoever you say. Why? Because you are rhema-ing with a double mouth sword. You are rhema-ing it. Say. You are calling it down by faith from the realm of the spirit. To the earthly realm, right? From the dimension of light to this realm of the physical. The, the physical dimension. You see? Faith is the bridge, right? Faith is the uh, substance of things hoped for. That is, the things that we speak for in the earthly realm. Okay? The evidence of things unseen. The Greek for evidence also means guarantee. The guarantee of things unseen. Things un unseen are in the uh, dimension of light, in the heavenly realm. See? And faith calls it down. You see? See, faith is what uh, affects the rhema, Amen. the happening. Amen. Amen. See? Amen. Okay? So that's why you do these things. Okay? And they've got to know these things. They've got to know their identity in Christ. They've got to know uh, their... Uh, uh, authority in Christ. They've got to know their position in Christ. You are seated in heavenly places. Well, if I'm seated in heavenly places, that means I can tap into heavenly things, doesn't it? And if I can tap into heavenly things, that means that I have access to the dimension of light. And what's in the dimension of light? The power. Right? 
and the anointing. And the power and the anointing are what manifest the healing and the deliverance. And all I've got to do is take possession by faith. See? So they've got to know their position in Christ. Right? Okay? So once they know these things, then you've got to find out, do they have the faith to receive? Okay? And if they don't, you've got to spend some time, maybe a session, two sessions, a week, two weeks, four weeks, building up their faith. And the best way to build up their faith is to review the faith scriptures with them. Okay? And when you review the faith scriptures with them, okay, you ask them, do you have the will to believe that and stand on it? See? And once they use their will and they become confident in it, then you start ministry. Because they've got to have the faith to receive the ministry, right? Okay? First things first, right? Okay. Now, uh, if you look in page 37 in the middle of the page, you'll see scriptures on the believer's authority and restored identification of the believer. You can review those on your, uh, on your own. Okay? I've already talked about the uh, paragraphs below. Okay, and it concludes on page 38 with the understanding that you as a minister must simply remember that faith is trust and you are stepping out on trusting the Lord. You have emptied yourself a vessel for his use and now you've got, from the moment you pray it and say it, you've got to trust it. Amen. Right? When you pray and say to the Lord, the steps of the righteous are led by the Lord. Lord, lead me in the questions to ask and the comments to make. I empty myself a vessel for your use and I yield to your Holy Spirit to do it. From that moment on, you have, you have confessed it. Now you trust it. That every word that comes out of your mouth is the Lord speaking through you. Right? When you pray with the ministry, the preparation of the heart and the response of the tongue is from the Lord. Lord, uh, and the ministry says, Lord, I yield to your Holy Spirit and trust you for the results. Once the ministry says that, every answer that the ministry gives, every response of the ministry's tongue, you have to trust is by the Holy Spirit. See? Everything hinges on trust. The entire kingdom of God yeah. operates by trust, faith. Amen. Amen. See? We use faith. The Aramaic New Testament doesn't even use the word faith. It doesn't exist in the Aramaic New Testament. The word is trust in the language Jesus spoke. See? How did faith get to be used? Again, the King James translators, what they were doing was they were taking the Hebrew and the Greek and they were uh, translating it into the contemporary English of their day so people could understand the Bible. And the contemporary English word for trust was faith. So they used the word faith. Okay, Faith is not something that we use today for the word trust. In modern English, we use the word trust, don't we? Okay? But in Biblical English, which is not modern English, Biblical English, okay, is uh, Old English and Middle English. The English that was spoken in the 1500s and 1600s. See? And that's the reason, uh, you know, why you have to understand the difference in the terminology. See? Also a reason why you don't put your faith in man. Huh? Amen. Right? I mean, can you think about it? We're still using a Bible that was translated into Old English and Middle English from the 1500s and 1600s. All the modern English versions after that are sort of loose translations, okay? And no one has yet done a highly accurate rendition uh, of uh, the King James or, or a modern English Bible translation in contemporary English, although some claim that the New King James is, okay, that's a matter of controversy. Okay? And here we are, 500 years later, okay, and man still hasn't thought to uh, do it in a highly accurate 
way without watering down the phrases because of copyrights. They're copyright infringements, which is why they do it. That's why uh, the uh, New International Version is somewhat watered it down. And uh, the uh, reprint of the New American Standard. So, but, uh, you know, I mean, that's what happens when we move by man rather than by the Holy Spirit. The Holy, you can use any Bible, and the Holy Spirit will show you the real meaning. That's what I do. I use them all. See? Right? I mean, don't put your faith in man. For God's sake, they didn't think of putting wheels on suitcases till 1964. <laughs> I saw the patent. You know? I saw the patent. Okay? 1964. Okay? I mean, can you believe that you put your faith in man? <laughs> huh? 1964, they put wheels on suitcases. Okay? They f started flying in 1903. Okay? So from 1903 to 1964, scientists, rocket scientists, all these, were carrying suitcases like this. They're out the airports for 67 years. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> what? And you want to put your faith in man? <laughs> Dear Lord, deliver us, huh? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Turn, if you would, to page 39, chapter 8, using the spiritual inventory. We're going to move on now. Okay. Using what? Using the spiritual inventory. Okay? Now, you must make the person understand that the way the inventory is going to be used by the Holy Spirit is to take them to where they need to be. Okay? In other words, it's not going to be self-effort. It's just going to be depending and relying on the Holy Spirit to do it and taking possession by faith. Okay? As I said last night, the Christian faith walk is not a walk of self-effort. Okay? It's a walk of depending on Christ. The word depend in the old English was abide. Abide on Christ. See, that's why it's so difficult to use translations like that. Because we don't use the word abide today, do we? Okay? So when the baby Christian reads something like abide on Christ, they don't know what abide on Christ means. Huh? Okay? Because it's an old English word that means depend upon, rely upon, dwell upon Christ. See? Okay? So, uh... <clears throat> The faith walk is abiding on Christ. So the first thing that I make them understand is they are being taken there. 1 Peter 5.10 After you have suffered a while, the God of all grace, he will establish, strengthen, perfect, and settle you. Okay? Philippians 1.6 He who has begun a good work in you is able to bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus who will perfect and settle you? He will. Who will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus? He will. Philippians 2.13. It is God who is at work in you to do his will and good pleasure. Who will do it? He will do it. Huh? Uh, Psalm 138, verse 8. He will perfect all things concerning me. Psalm 57, verse 2. I will cry out to God, Most High, to God who accomplishes all things for me. So you must make them understand that they are being taken there by depending, by relying, by trusting. That's faith. Then they're going to be more receptive toward trusting for the healing and the deliverance and the circumcision of heart and the freedom from the sin or the generation's curses through confession, repentance, and renouncing. Okay? 
It's very important that they understand that and that the conviction is there. Okay? We begin privately before they come in. I have them uh, confess and repent their personal sins. I do the same. Okay? Every morning before I go into a session also. Why? Because Psalm 24 verse 4 says, Who can stand on the hill of the Lord except he who has a pure heart and clean hands? Right? So you've got to have a pure heart and clean hands. See? Okay? And you stand on the hill of the Lord. No, there's two kinds of saints. I don't know whether you know this or not. There's two kinds of saints of God. Okay? There's the one who becomes born again, gets cleaned up immediately, okay? Only occasionally sins, walks forthright and doesn't sin or sins very little from that moment on, and he's a saint of God. And then there's the saint who day after day or week after week, out of weakness or, or lack of strength, falls into sin, okay? Gets up, brushes himself off, repents back to God, Okay, goes a day or two or three, falls into sin, gets up, brush himself off, repents back to relationship with God, keeps walking, okay, that way. And guess what? He's as much a saint of God as the first one was. Okay, as a matter of fact, the perfect example of the second one was David. Hmm? See? David fell into sin. If you read 1 Samuel, chapter 16 through 31, okay, you will see David's sins. Okay? Every time he fell, he immediately got back in repentance to God. And he walked straight to God. And what did God call him in the Psalms? The apple of my eye. At the end. The apple of my eye. See? The apple of my eye. Okay? See? Both are saints in God's eyes. See? Okay? All right. Now, if you'll turn to page 40. Okay. What does God honor in those circumstances, by the way? The willingness to repent. The willingness to be in right standing with him. That's what he honors. Not the performance. See, it isn't the performance with God. Okay? It's the heart. Right? Remember? He wants a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. Spirit to spirit, soul to soul. See? Okay? That's why the spirit of the word gives life and the letter of the word kills. See, you can be in the letter of the word church and it'll kill you because they got everybody under performance. See, everybody, under, and if you fall into sin, you got to come up front and you got you to gotta confess your sins publicly. You see? And some of those churches, like uh, the cults such as the Jehovah Witnesses, okay, when someone falls into sin, to sin the rest of them shun them. Right? And not only that, that's what uh, the Quakers used to do. You see, religious, religiosity, that stuff has nothing to do with the Christian faith walk. If you are going to be part of the ministry of reconciliation and the ministry of restoration, the ministry, the person receiving ministry, must see in you and through you the heart of the Father. Okay, and the heart of the Father is not legalism, and the heart of the Father is not performance, okay? The heart of the Father is to love people to life, Amen. okay? Love the unlovable, hug the unhuggable, reach the unreachable, touch the untouchable. Boy, that's Amen. tough. Because I have some people that come and I want to bite out their left juggler vein with my bare teeth. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit overwhelms me. Praise <laughs> God. You see? You see? And the love of the Father is to love people to life. See? Not to kick them when they're down and make them uh, feel guilt and shame and blame. Okay? But to love them to life. See? To love them to life. And that takes a while sometimes. Standing by them. Being there for them. See? Okay? 
And, and so if you're going to show them in ministry, uh, if you're going to show them the spirit of the Father, the spirit of God, you've got to love them in the life, right? It isn't legalism. It isn't religiosity, okay? Religious people always resist the Holy Spirit, okay? Religious people always resist the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe that, look at some of the religious churches and denominations, the Orthodox Church, okay, the Roman Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, right, okay, uh, and I'm not criticizing this, this is an observation, okay, not a criticism, okay, what you see there, okay, is people following religion. What's the problem there? The problem is that regardless of what denomination it is, okay, religion is the wrong tree. There were two trees of major importance in the Garden of Eden, weren't there? Huh? The tree of life, that's Jesus. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's religion. See? At the tree of life, you know Jesus. At the tree of life, you know the transformative power of the work of the cross. At the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know about Jesus. At the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know about the finished work of the cross. But at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is what? Religion, why? It's the knowledge of good and evil, right? This is good, I better do this. That's evil, I better not do that. Oh. This is evil, I better not do this. That's good, I better do that. And before you know it, what are you doing? You're walking. And you're walking. And you're walking under self-effort. Huh? Right? You're walking under self-effort to do this and not do that. And do this and not do that. Doing this observance, watching that observance. Right? Okay? And what is it? This walk. Okay? is self-effort, works. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace through faith. Huh? Okay? And as long as you're doing the self-effort and the self-walking, you create a structure in your life, and it becomes rules and regulations. Right? And what is rules and regulations? Religion. And that's why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents religion. Say, who was standing at that tree? Satan. Say, come on over here. Take a bite. Say, okay? And what did Jesus say? When Satan comes, he comes as an angel of light. In other words, looks like the real thing. Doesn't say he is an angel of light. Says he comes as an angel of light. Looks like the real thing. Huh? But it isn't. It's a counterfeit. Walk, they, they talk Jesus. They use scripture. Okay? But that doesn't make it Christian. Amen. The criteria for something being Christian is one, the appearance, and two, the content. Is the content there? See? And when you look, you see that the appearance is there. They talk Jesus, right? They use scripture, they use, they, they may even mention the word of God, right? But when you start examining the doctrine, the doctrines aren't there. The doctrines of Christ aren't there, are they? You see? So it's a counterfeit, okay? You can never know God through religion, okay? And you say, yeah, but there's spirit-filled people in all those churches. Sure there are. Why? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't relate to organizations. He relates to people. And he is not there sanctioning what they're doing and approving of what they're doing. He is there to witness to them, to show them the power to get them out of that darkness and into him. That's what he's there for. See? And when God gives that grace, guess what? Grace demands a response. See, once God gives you the revelation that you're feeding from the wrong tree, you have to buy grace. You have to respond to grace. Okay? And go and walk and feed from the right tree. See? Or else you're not responding to grace. You're in disobedience. Okay? 
the best way, and sometimes you got to minister that to the ministries, okay? Because where they're at and where they're worshiping at is a hindrance, okay, to their getting set free, okay? And why? The reason is because God has a standard, and he does not lower his standard because of man's ignorance. That's why, okay? There is a difference between being in God's acceptance. When you're born again, you're in God's acceptance, right? But there's a difference between being in God's acceptance and being in God's approval. Only the remnant, the true church of the scripture, is in God's acceptance and God's approval. And how do you do that? By walking by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, through the word, the water, and the blood alone, and no doctrines of men. Okay, And anything other than that is not the true doctrine of Christ. Okay, It's a counterfeit, it's sin, and it will hinder the healing and the restoration of the person. If they are in a false church, okay, they cannot get the fullness of their healing. See, you can be saved in a false church in God's acceptance. Because when you're born again, you're accepted unconditionally. Right? But you won't be in God's approval until you do things his way and meet his standard... And what is his standard? John 4, 24. Those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. So what you must teach the ministry is what you are practicing, is that the truth of the word of God? And if it isn't, okay, and they refuse to walk, okay, I promise you they're probably not going to get a full deliverance or a full healing. Say. Okay, Because you can't walk according to your own understanding. God's got a standard. He's not going to lower it because of your ignorance. So you better find out what God's standard is. So yes? Whether you do attend the membership Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or just the Easter. Okay, the question is, what do you do with family members who are Jehovah Witnesses, Catholics, etc.? Okay, what you do is you witness Jesus to them. Okay? You don't try to persuade because persuasion doesn't work. Remember what we said at the beginning, you weren't here, but at the beginning of this series. Okay? The reason you do ministry in the Spirit is because revelation brings transformation. See? Not, not persuasion. See? So the only one who can give revelation to these folks is Jesus. So you witness Jesus. Right? Jesus said, if I be uplifted, I will draw all men unto me. See? And he'll draw them. Okay? All right. Now, page 40, top of the page, an overview of the spiritual inventory. Okay? <clears throat> We're going to quit here. And... Uh, We'll begin section one at the bottom of the page in our next session, okay? I want you to look at the top of the page, and you will see that this spiritual inventory contains 17 sections, okay? Section one is the personal life inventory and marriage inventory. If you look to your extreme right, it will show you the appendix numbers to use to minister Okay, the prayers that deal with the issues of that particular section. Okay? Section 2 is the curse inventory. Section 3 is the occult involvement and exposure inventory. This will bring out, okay, section 1 is going to, personal life inventory and marriage inventory is going to show you What's going on in the life of the ministry at this point in time and what's happened to them in the past? It's going to uncover for you also whether there are any familial problems, hereditary problems such as witchcraft. It's also going to cover, uh, uncover for you things like, issues like unforgiveness or negative emotions in relationships to family problems. Okay, And it's going to uncover for you also areas where they may need circumcision of the heart, and it's also going to show you some things 
that are going to prompt you to ask them, is there anyone else in the family that's had these experiences or behaves the same way? Which will tell you if there are generations curses there that need to be broken. Okay? And so we always start out with the marriage and family inventory to find out what's going on in the life of the person and in the life of their family right now. See? Okay? That gives us a baseline. In section two, we try to find out what kind of curses are operating in their life right now. Whether they're generational, whether they're self-inflicted, or whether they're curses spoken over by, uh, 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 or upon them by others. You know, sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot when we uh, say something negative about ourselves, you know? Okay, and we don't realize what we're doing. It's a self-inflicted curse. And, and we give examples in the inventory so that they can recognize if they've said anything like that. Okay? Uh, uh, you know, uh, an example. I've, I've heard people say, uh, oh, I'll probably get cancer like my father got cancer. Yeah. <laughs> Just shot themselves in the foot. See? Why? They're cursing themselves. There's an ex they've just expressed an expectation, didn't they? Yeah. See? And so when, you, when, you, when that happens, what do you do? You tell them, confess, repent, and retract the words, and break the curse that you said in the name of Jesus. Okay? Curses spoken by others. Okay? I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say in a ministry session, oh, my mother said, oh, you'll never amount to anything. Oh, you'll, you know, uh, your marriage will probably fail like, your marriage will fail like all the rest of them in this family. What are those things? They're curses. Recognize them for what they are and deal with them. Okay? And then the generation's curses uh, we've already talked about. Okay? Section three. Occult involvement and exposure inventory. And you see the appendix is 10 on the right there. In this uh, section, what we uncover is uh, their dabbling or exposure or practice of witchcraft or any within their family lines. Okay, why is it important to know about their family also? Because even if, now watch this, this is important to know. Even if the person receiving ministry, the ministry, has never been involved in witchcraft, or has never dabbled in the occult or the new age, or the martial arts, or anything like that, but a parent or a grandparent has, Satan considers them hereditary witches. Got that? Satan considers, because there's a generation's curse of witchcraft, that comes down four generations, even if they have not yet started. Satan considers them hereditary witches. Okay? And that has to be broken off. That's why we do these kinds of inventories. Okay? All right. Uh, section four. The cursed objects inventory. Why is this important to know about? Cursed objects. Joshua 7.13. Unless you get the cursed thing out from under your midst, you cannot stand against your enemies. Okay? The objects themselves is nothing. Okay? But Satan attaches a spirit to the object. Okay? And, and many of these objects are beautiful, by the way. Okay? When you look at them in the house, they're idols, so look in high places. Remember the high places of the Old Testament? Where the uh, uh, idols of Baal were set up? Huh? Okay? Legal ground. So look in houses and high places, knickknacks on top of bookshelves and places. Real important cursed objects, Satan will hide, hide low on shelves and in the back where you won't notice it. Okay? But, but the point is, uh, or in drawers where you forget about it. Huh? Okay? But, uh, or in trunks or boxes in the closet where you forget about it. Okay? But the point I'm trying to make to you is that the, the object is nothing but Satan attaches or witches attach a spirit to it. When the spirit gains entrance to the house, it can begin its ministry. Many of them are very beautiful. Okay? Suspect a cursed object 
as a problem within the house or in the person's life, okay, if they have trouble surrendering it, it means a lot to them and they don't want to give it up. That is being ministered to them. See? We had a young girl that had that problem. She had multiple sclerosis. And she didn't want to give up the objects in her house, but she knew she had to. She says, well, send someone over from the church to take them out because I can't, I don't have the heart to do it myself. And we sent someone, in fact, I think it was Rudy, with uh, a hammer and a burlap bag. Okay? I said, Rudy, when you go over there, make sure you use it on the objects and not the person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> I really didn't say that. I really didn't. <laughs> okay. So then, uh, Rudy went over, okay, and this girl was partially paralyzed from the multiple sclerosis. She was lying on a stretcher. She couldn't get up and walk around. Okay. Rudy started taking the cursed objects down from the shelf, putting them in the burlap bag, and breaking them with the hammer. Guess what? This girl started delivering, started vomiting. The spirits were leaving. Yeah, see? I mean, that's the kind of stuff you'll... This stuff is serious stuff. We have had people with... We have had people with good marriages. And all of it, they were given a gift, brought this cursed object into the house, and then the next thing you know, they start arguing. Okay, it's being ministered to them by the spirit attached. They start arguing, and the next thing you know, they're near divorce. See? You've seen that too. Yeah. See, and they got marriage problems where they never had marriage problems before, okay? And we start looking for the cursed object in the house, remove it, and things get better. That's why we have a cursed object inventory. See, you may think that because they have marriage and arguments in their family that they need circumcision of the heart, okay? When the problem is they need to get the cursed object out of the house. It's my mother's rosaries. Your mother's rosaries, yes. Exactly. And when you got that out of the house, all that phenomenon, the spirits that you were seeing, everything stopped. Yeah. See? Okay? So when you see these things, we have these things here so that they can show you if these things are contributing to ministry. Okay? Uh, cursed objects inventory. Number five, physical trauma inventory. Have they had injuries in the past? Significant injuries. Open wounds. Uh, are uh, a means of demonic entry. Cuts. Spirits will enter. Okay? That's why you cover your loved ones every day with the blood of Jesus. And every night with the blood of Jesus because the spirits can't get past the blood. We had a guy once with a spirit of anger. And James was doing the deliverance. Okay? And... Uh, uh, he was 35 years old, had anger all of his life from when he was five years old. Okay? And, and James bound the spirit to speak truthfully. He says, how did you enter? And the spirit says, when he was five years old, he said he was riding his tricycle in the tar driveway, and he fell off of the tricycle, and he got an abrasion on his back, and he started to bleed, and I entered through the abrasion, the spirit said. See? Okay? And that's why, you know, we uncover all of these things. Okay? Uh, emotional trauma inventory. Passivity of mind, trauma, or emotions. Okay? Tra traumatic experiences are an open door for demonic entry. That's why we want to know the traumas. We want to get at the seed, the root, and the fruit, and we want to pray the healing. Huh? Okay? All right? Number seven, the heart inventory. Okay? This is a very interesting inventory. Let me tell you. You'll pick up some things here that ordinarily you wouldn't expect to see in a particular person. Okay? They love the Lord. Okay? But something happened in their past and they're lukewarm toward the Lord. Their heart isn't there. The zeal isn't there. You know, something like that. And the inventory, the heart inventory, will uh, uncover where they are in their relationship with the Lord, where they are with their relationship with loved ones. Say. Okay? Uh, eight, the spiritual knowledge inventory. This is a good one to look at first. Okay? The spiritual knowledge inventory, uh, okay, is uh, an extremely important one 
because you want to know whether they've got the knowledge to take the healing, to take possession of the healing. See? And this may be one of the first things that you have to deal with early before you start ministry with them. All right? Nine, the negative emotions inventory will unmask uh, anger, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, hate, spite, and everything else. And then you'll have to determine whether that's part of a generation's curse system, okay? And or whether it also requires circumcision of the heart, not just confession and repentance and renouncing, okay? Uh, ten, the sexual conduct inventory, okay? People are sometimes hesitant to fill this out. If they don't want to do it, don't push Go back at a later time. When they start seeing their freedom, start seeing their healing, start seeing their deliverance, they're going to be more willing. See? Let them go at their own pace. See? Sometimes they don't want to do the whole inventory. They don't think they're ready for it. Okay. When are they ready for it? When they ask for it. See? Some people come in and they want it all. They want to be cleaned now. Not now. <laughs> See? <laughs> okay. When Nora first came, she had her first session. I said, we had two hours. I said, okay, we'll continue the next session. She said, what? You're going to leave these demons behind? She said, I want them all out now. <laughs> I said, Nora, it doesn't work that way. I said, we've got to work through issues first. She said, you mean they're not going to all leave that? No. <laughs> Okay, quickly, so we can go home. The sexual conduct inventory. Remember that when we have them fill out the, uh, the sheets, we normally do not have them put their name on it. Okay? Here at Word of Faith, we do it two ways. We either let them keep the inventory, take it home, uh, where it's always in their possession, and they are responsible for its safety. Okay? Here... What we do is rather than put their name on it, if they want, they can put a code number of numbers and letters that only they know. They write it down on a piece of paper, and they put that paper in their wallet, and then they go to a safe here. We give them the key. They unlock it. They find their inventory because only they know their number. We don't know their number. And then uh, after we get done using it in the session, they return it to the locked cabinet, and they lock it in. See? And because we don't see the number, we don't know which inventory is theirs, which one is not theirs. Okay? So their privacy is always maintained and protected, whether they keep it here or whether they keep it at home. Okay? You will notice some very specific questions that are noted or asked on the sexual part of the inventory. Okay? Firstly, you've got to educate them. For those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation, no blame, no shame, no guilt. There is nothing on that inventory that any experienced minister hasn't heard 3,000 times before anyway. Okay? And we're not there to judge them. Okay? We're there to help them. And when the inventory asks a specific question, it is not necessary to go and delve into the lurid details. Okay? For instance, if the person has been practicing sodomy, it's not necessary to ask them what went on. Okay? <laughs> okay? And would you mind describing the experience in details for me? Okay? We don't care about that stuff. Who cares about the details? You're just dealing with is the sin there or not so that it can be dealt with. That's all. Okay? Nothing we haven't heard before. Okay? And when they understand that, they're more willing to fill out the sexual conduct inventory because they know we're not going to judge them for that. Okay? The scripture says these things are common to all men. It doesn't. It? See? So if you give them the right perspective, they're more willing to fill it out. When they understand is, we don't want details. All we want to know is, is that a sin that has to be uh, confessed and repented of so that you can get that excess baggage out of your life? See, right motive, okay? All right. Uh, Eleven, secret or hidden sin inventory. If the person has a secret or a hidden sin, Okay, 
they'll have trouble getting deliverance. Or they'll have trouble getting healing or circumcision of the heart. See, got to be dealt with. Okay? And there are many things in that inventory that ordinarily you and I wouldn't think about. See? So it acts both as a cue stimulus and a reminder. Okay? Twelve covenant and faith walk inventory will show you where they are with God. Right now. Okay? Covenant and faith walk inventory. And what has to be resolved there before the Lord can bless them. See? So you might want to look at section uh, 8 and 12 first before you do the other inventories at the beginning of ministry to find out what their knowledge is and where they are with God. See? You see how the advantages of using an inventory? Okay? All right. Uh, 13, dreams and visions inventory. Okay? Now, this is really very important. And here's why it's important. Because there are spirits that are called, demonic spirits that are called gatekeepers and doorkeepers. The gatekeepers and the doorkeeper spirits are the gatekeepers and the doorkeepers to the person's dream life. Okay? And they're the ones that filter in the garbage. Okay? that minister to people during their dreams. When dreams are of God, they are orderly. They are usually vivid. Okay? They are never contrary to the word of God. And they are highly organized because it reflects God. Do everything decently and in order. Okay? When dreams are demonic, okay, they are chaotic and nonsensical. Very often sexual. And when they are sexual... They are dreams or visions. The person will frequently say, I have this experience like I'm having sex with something in my sleep. Okay? Uh, or I feel like something's on top of me. And if it's a woman, uh, what they're describing is an incubus spirit, a male sexual demon. And if it's a man, what they're describing is a female uh, sexual demon called a succubus spirit. And traditionally, in deliverance ministry, you have been taught that the incubus and the succubus, and this is very common, by the way, okay? You have been taught that the incubus and the succubus spirit uh, are sexual demons. They are not sexual demons. And they are not separate demons. The incubus succubus is a single spirit called a, a form changer or a changeling, okay? It changes. Okay, appearance when it ministers to a woman or to a man. The incubus in the succubus, or, the, or the, this incubus hyphen succubus spirit, is not a sexual spirit, it is a vampire spirit. Okay, and it belongs to the class of vampires called the lilim. All right, you remember we talked about the spirit of Lilith, the vampire witch queen. Okay, queen of witches and vampires. That spirit, Lilith. The daughter spirits of Lilith are the Lilim in the Hebrew, okay? Uh, the night hag, the screech owl, uh, the night monster were the titles or, or the uh, alternate names of Lilith, what she called herself, okay? Mentioned in Isaiah 34 14, okay? The night hag or the screech owl, okay? And one of the other daughters of Lila, one of the other vampire spirits, is the satyr, which is also mentioned in Isaiah 34, 14, and is also mentioned in 2 Chronicles. Okay? These things are real, folks. They're in the Bible. Okay? And what you got to know is that in the dream life, when the vampire spirit is ministering, okay, what it is doing by sexual contact, uh, contact is it's draining soul energy from the person. Okay? Vampire spirits should be suspected when anywhere in the inventory you see people visiting cemeteries frequently in their family history, having grave dirt in the house, in bags, okay, because they think that this is a witchcraft protection that the voodooin gives them or some priest or priestess of witchcraft gives them. Okay, that attaches to them a vampire spirit. That's what that does, okay? The vampire spirit is present 
when a person feels chronic fatigue all the time. They get up. Chronic immune fatigue syndrome is not a neurological disease. Chronic, it's the physical manifestation of a vampire spirit. So is leukemia. And so are some anemias. Okay? And so is acute intermittent porphyria. Okay, if you look at those diseases, they have all of the symptoms of those diseases are identical with the symptoms of vampirism. Okay, and the spirits in the kingdom of darkness operate by uh, occult physiology, what they believe is the physiology of the soul life. And that is best uh, uh, exemplified if you want to know what they're doing. Okay, by uh, looking at the Hindu physiology. You ever see the guy with the crossed legs with the different stars here and here and here and here and here and here? Those are called the chakras in their occult terminology. And those are psychic energy centers to them. Okay, to them. Okay, and psychic means soul life, doesn't it? Okay, in other words, those are the centers where the spirits uh, tap in to tap the soul energy that they live off of, okay? To try to weaken the person so that the other demons can minister to them and they, have, they feel weak and they can't resist. They have a harder time resisting, see? Okay? Now, when uh, they touch the sexual center, the vampire spirit withdraws that psychic energy. These people become weak sexually, say, in, in the resistance of sexual temptation, etc. And they have trouble, okay, with sexual sin, okay? Have you ever noticed that these people that have trouble with sexual sin are the ones that give you the dreams of the incubus and suckers, how they're attacked sexually during the night? Okay, when, when the vampire spirit attacks the crown chakra in the forehead and they withdraw, okay, over time the soul life or they try to minister that to the person, okay, these are the folks that end up with Alzheimer's disease and they lose their memory, okay? Not only that, there's two other spirits that work with the vampire in that. One is called the thought eater. And the other one is uh, called the mind binder. See? Okay? Uh, and, and, and you see how, what they're doing? They're taking from the person's soul life. They're fragmenting the soul. Okay? Psalm 7, verse 2. Soul fragmentation. See? That's what they're doing when they draw the soul life. That's vampirism. See? Fragmenting the soul. Okay, what happens when the vampire draws it from uh, the heart chakra, the heart psychic center? Sudden death, cardiac arrest, no reason at all. You see how they work? These are all vampire spirits. See? Okay, and by the way, the vampire spirit is one of the commonest ones around. Okay, and it is one of the least dealt with in the deliverance ministry. Okay, when you see a pastor's wife who has fatigue all the time, it's a vampire spirit because uh, pastor's wives are one of their favorite targets. See, if they can have the pastor's wife tired all the time so that the pastor has to take care of her and do things for her, okay, what ends up happening is the pastor's got less time for the church and less time for ministry, huh? Yeah. See what they're doing? Okay, let's move on. We're almost done. Bear with me. Soul tie inventory. Okay, these are... Soul ties have to be broken for a person to be free. Soul ties are unholy or holy. David and Jonathan had a holy soul tie. Right? Anytime uh, uh, you uh, fall into the situation that Paul mentions, he who's, who uh, lies with a harlot becomes one with her. That's a soul tie. Anytime you have illicit sexual intercourse, okay, through adultery, fornication, outside of marriage, you have made a soul tie with someone, okay? And that soul tie is with you even later on in life, 
when you find that you married someone else, but your mind, your soul, is always drifting back to the memory of your ex-girl, okay? Or that's that significant other with whom you had a sexual relationship, okay? Why does that mind drift back? Okay, that's the soul power, see? And when you break it, that'll stop, and they'll be free, see? Okay? So... That's what the soul tie inventory is for. Okay? Okay? 15, demonic oppression screening inventory will show you what sorts of demons are on board as a general screen. These are the big guys, the main ones. Okay? Remember, there are thousands of demons. There's no way we could go through an inventory. Okay? Because if we named them all and we had to find out by an inventory who has what demon... Okay, the inventory would be so big that you would start today and it probably would finish in the year 2030. Okay, so, uh, you know, by which time the person that you're ministering to is probably 78 years old on their deathbed and you wouldn't have any need to finish the inventory of the ministry anyway because they're ready to go home to the Lord. Okay, so that's not how we do it. The way we do it is we ask the Holy Spirit if there is anything that is not mentioned in the, minute, in the inventory to give us the revelation of what other spirits are on board. Okay? Okay, 16. Unresolved issues inventory. Very, very important. Okay? When you read it, you will see, when we get to it and you read it, it'll be self-evident. Things that people forgot. Okay? Issues that were unresolved for which they harbored feelings and then something happened. Either the person moved away before the issue was resolved or they moved away before the issue was resolved or the person died, okay, with whom they had a problem, okay, and the issues were never resolved and there was never closure, okay? This inventory will bring that out, okay? And then the last thing... The addendums, miscellaneous issues which the ministry wants to the ministry wants to discuss things that aren't mentioned in the spiritual inventory, but are uncovered as you're going through all the sections. Okay, as they're uncovered, and and the ministry says, you know, I got this feeling or this issue, and it's not mentioned in the inventory. Go to section 17, write it in, so that at the end you can address all the problems that the ministry wants to bring up. Okay? That's an overview of the spiritual inventory. In our next session, we will start going through the sections, and I will give you pointers about how to use each section to your maximum advantage. Okay? So that you will feel comfortable, okay, uh, in ministering to the ministry. Amen? Amen? Father, we give you all the thanks, praise, and glory. And if there's anyone now... Who wants to ask uh, questions, we'll spend just two or three minutes, and then we're going to close with uh, a, a song of worship to the Lord for the way he's using the ministry in bringing forth all this revelation. Any questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned Zoe Life of God. What's that? Never in terms. Okay. The Zoe Life of God is the God kind of life, okay, or the life of the Spirit. It is the life that you have when you become born again because his spirit indwells you, right? And you become the new creation. Here on the earth, you don't, uh, if you are not saved, you don't have the Zoe life, okay? Uh, what you have is age-enduring life, life of time and space, okay? Uh, life that goes on eons until eons until time ceases, okay? That is called eonic life, okay? But, you see, Adam and Eve existed in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God, in heaven, which meant that originally they were beings of light. They had Zoe life. But when they fell, okay, into the physical dimension, okay, and they spiritually died, they lost the Zoe life and they took on eonic life. Life that exists in time and space. Say. But when you get born again, your spirit man is restored to Zoe life with Christ, which means now you can tap into the spirit and bring that life and power to the circumstance. Where does that Say, term come from? What is your significance? It's the Greek word for, for the life of the spirit. Yeah, Zoe. 
Zoe means the life of the spirit. Z O E. Z O E. Or anyone? Yes. Yes. Uh, Impartation. Right. Oh, exactly. To be effective, the prophecy should be accompanied by laying of hands? No, no. Okay. Remember, the, the, the ministry of impartation is two forms. The spoken word alone or the spoken word with the laying on of hands. Either is the ministry of impartation. Okay? So when a prophet speaks, that's ministry of impartation. When a prophet speaks and lay hands, that's still the ministry of impartation. Okay? Anybody else? I yeah. All right. Explain that about the copyrights in reference to the Bible. I don't understand that part. What rights? Copyright. You, you spoke about the copyright that the, the Bible. Oh, okay. Right. One, of the, yeah, one of the reasons that what is, what, she wants to know why I mentioned about copyrights in the Bibles. Have you ever noticed different versions of the Bible? When you look at a verse, they say it a different way. And that way may be watered down. The reason is because of copyright. They can't say it word for word the way another Bible uh, has it already because if they do, they're plagiarizing. See, And that's one of the major reasons why some of the new Bibles okay, are so watered down because they can't violate copyright. See, other reasons why is because a lot of the people doing the translations aren't spirit-filled. See? Yeah, okay. Are we done? I have one question, but I, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Shall we close with the... Tomorrow night we'll meet 7.30, okay? Are you enjoying this? Yes. yes. Glory to God. We're going to have a Saturday session. And Sunday. Saturday night. 